Stephanie is an artist and a, a, an author in terms of designing um, pieces that showcase state in a different way that we usually wouldn't think about. Um, some of her work uh, can be seen at the VMA. Also, she's uh, had some of her work in a welcome uh, collection as well as the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And with that, a good big welcome to Stephanie. I look forward to hearing from her. Thank you. I am on. Okay. Um, I just like to open up with saying um, apologies for my voice. I have a cold. <laughs> so um, please forgive the, ras the raspy voice, but I will, uh, you know, power through. Um, yeah. So I am Stephanie. Uh, nice to meet you all. Um, I say that I'm a communication designer who creates data-driven designs for both art commissions and commercial work, ranging from information design to creating physical objects, animations, and public installations using data. Um, I started to say recently that I like to make things out of data that don't necessarily look like what you would expect something made out of data to look like, which isn't like the most punchy of uh, strap lines, so I'm going to work on that. But um, another way of describing what I do, um, that's probably a little easier, is with a little drawing here. Um, so I, I say that I'm a designer whose favorite creative material, above all others, is data. So if you've got a subject matter, some, you know, some sort of subject matter, um, that you're responding to, you know, some people might use photography, some might use pencil or video to respond to and reflect upon that subject. But for me, <coughs> data and data is the material that I choose to work with. Um, and so I work with data in a little bit of a diff different way than some people do. Um, as uh, using this material, I aim to communicate messages that will go beyond the insights found within the data that I'm working with, where uh, my end intention is to create work or communicate a, me a message that's often more emotive and often more subjective than what um, you know might be found in a more traditional chart or data visualization. So I sort of say that is something a little bit different. Um, another thing about how I work that's probably critical um, is uh, that I, uh, I don't really code much. I have a little bit. Um, and I will collaborate with developers to help automate various processes and like set up code in a way that I can't mess it up as I just change a number. Um, and uh, this really comes from very early on in my practice as uh, uh, for many of my projects I analyze and gather data by hand and this early constraint further influenced me to work with data in this very handmade way. So you'll see uh, this influence through a few of the projects that I'll show you today. Um, the last thing I guess about me is that um, I teach a lot of professional workshops, uh, professional data biz workshops, um, or like to students, it could be like physical data biz, um, but really um, what I like to do is to use drawing materials and off-screen approaches to um, teach people how to um, kind of create custom data visualizations to get off-screen and to explore um, kind of 
designing uh, visualization approaches um, from a different angle instead of using um, like the tools that they normally use and hope it inspires them when they come back to those tools. Um, so yeah, so that's, what I, that's probably another reason I lost my voice. I was teaching a workshop today. Uh, but anyway, um, so other things about me. Um, so uh, this is just a talk about me figuring out where I am in the world. Um, when I introduce myself right now, I am talking explicitly about how I'm a designer. And this is a recent shift from calling myself an artist which was like this big deal. Um, and that was a shift from calling myself a designer. So I've changed my mind I'm back at the beginning. Um, and the reason for this is that over the past year, I have been reflecting upon my recent art residencies and art commissions. And I, I've actually realized that the majority of the projects that I make are created to serve a very particular type of audience or community. Or if you will, I sort of see them as a very particular client that I serve. Um, when I make the work that I make, that I would say would generally fall into one of the following groups, um, <coughs> such as, uh, firstly, uh, newcomers to data of all ages from age four to age 100 who barely know about data at all. Like I always have them in the back of my mind when I'm making projects. Um, also, um, I am another kind of client or audience I'm trying to speak to are people who don't care about data, who think it's boring or it's not worth their time. So, you know, I want to change their mind and maybe just have them look for like another second longer. And um, then also, uh, I would say people who are intimidated by data, who um, for whom data feels like something that's far removed from their, from their daily lives, something that's cold, clinical, computerized, and hidden away in, in like big blue servers, like this photo of a Google um, data center. And then also um, another kind of client or community I'm trying to speak to or, want, or communities that aren't really art or design focus, uh, or where I'm not preaching to the choir, if you will, but I'm trying to find a new, new ways of presenting data um, in ways that best serve this audience, where in order to connect and communicate with them, one has to move um, beyond possibly more um, like cold and clinical forms of data, something very human scaled and warm and personal. Um, and with this way of thinking, um, my goal when working with data is to serve this audience, either real or imagined in my mind, through extending the, the visual languages designers use to work with data. And so then I try to experiment with data viz in the same way a communication designer might normally push the limits of typography, layouts, illustration, and so on. And so through this extension of what's possible with data, I try to find uh, ways of presenting data that besides uh, being legible for the, that context are more memorable and more expressive to a layperson audience who might just be learning about data for the first time. So this could mean making data danceable, um, like this project from, gosh, from a long time ago now, as the first data artist in residence at Facebook in California, where I converted a month of a couple's interactions on Facebook timelines, like all with their consent, of course, um, into dance steps, so bringing their digital dance across timelines into a physical space, where at the same time I also aim to serve that Facebook employee community by making that constant journey between meetings in the various buildings on the Menlo Park campus more enjoyable mm -hmm. by giving them a chance to dance from place to place. And then that sort of fed into this other project where I was making data hoppable, um, like for my open data playground um, at the South Bank Center in London, which again is starting to feel like many moons ago, where um, hopscotch games were created from open data sets in order to communicate how open data sets are online for anyone to interpret and play with however they choose, even if some people, you know, choose to interpret that data in uh, less conventional ways than others. Um, where again, you know, I'm trying to create work to ser serve a diverse all ages community of people passing by, trying to appeal both to small children who just need a jump, place to jump around and also to the uh, um, adults and parents who are standing by watching and, you know, giving them that deeper message about open data. Um, and then it can also mean projects that are touchable and wearable, like this art commission I created with my constant collaborator, Miriam Quick, where we explored physical ways of communicating open air quality data from Sheffield in a memorable experiential way for a citizen audience who might not be interested in air quality or data in general. And 
Um, one part of this project presented weeks of particulate matter as something that you could touch and wear. And then the other part communicated a day of pollution levels in Sheffield through glasses that would make your vision more or less polluted and hazy depending on the data. Um, so yeah, so that's a very quick kind of dive into the sort of work I do. Um, these are earlier commissions where I retrospectively realized that I actually, like all of my work is focusing on serving the needs of the specific audience that I outlined. Um, but at the same time as these community and public focus commissions, I was focusing on a very personal small scale project, um, a collaboration from a while ago with uh, Georgia Lupi, uh, you know, data, the data designer, who I'm sure you all know and love. Um, uh, Georgia and I only met twice in person when we decided to collaborate with each other and we came up with uh, this project, Your Data, you may have heard of, which was a year of sending each other hand-drawn data postcards back and forth across the Atlantic. Um, so uh, yeah, so for a year, every week, we would collect our personal data around a shared topic um, and um, to then investigate aspects of ourselves and then our days to then share with the other person. And then uh, this is all done, uh, no tableau, sorry guys, this is all very manual. Um, when the data was collected, at the end of the week, we would analyze our data and then draw our visualizations and our annotations on a postcard. And then we were finished, we would post it to the other person and then wait, and then if all went well, that postcard would arrive at the other person's dress, and you know, we'd grab a coffee, sit down, and read and learn more about the other person's life. And so yeah, so this went on for a year and it culminated in 52 weeks of personal data sets and custom visualizations tailored to that data. And there's some examples of some of the ones that I drew on the scene on screen. Um, that was obviously a quick run through the projects. I've got a couple more recent projects. Um, but like, it, it does come in book form. So I have a book if, in case anyone wants to have a look at them up close. Anyone? <laughs> Yay. Thank you for taking the lead and reaching out. Um, so yeah, so um, yeah, so as you can see, this uh, project, in a way, it's not really like the other ones I've done. It's an outlier due to its personal nature, but um, to our surprise, um, the small personal project had this great public response, and that's what we're really proud of, as we found um, this manual domestic way of introducing people to data resonated with them, and we received emails from people starting their data correspondence projects of their own, or they're using that like to teach uh, how to collect and present data, um, you know, from like primary school to university and beyond, which is really great. And so this really wide audience connected with it in a way I've never anticipated, or we never anticipated. And so this connection has further influenced me for how I try to speak to the audience as I serve. And I'll explain this in more detail when I show a couple projects in depth. And another thing off the back of the Dear Data project is that um, you know, with so many people creating their own Dear Data projects, we moved from the personal to something more outward looking. Um, we decided to create a journal that would make the data and drawing process less intimidating. And so we published uh, this journal, Observe, Collect, Draw, um, that people could use to document their lives and then through gathering and drawing their own data. And so that was released um, in, I guess it's 2020, 2018. Um, so I've got, if anyone wants to have a little, I'll, I'll put, if, in case anyone cares about these things, I'll pass them around. Um, but the way that the journal works, and like on the left, there's these data collection prompts and data drawing rules that can be customized for the reader. And then following those rules and collecting your data, you can draw your data and create a visual documentation of, um, you know, your data and so your life. So like, you know, here's a quick example, like you've got the pet where you can like visualize and draw your past and draw on the right or um, draw your friendships in order to better understand your relationships with them. And um, what I really like about this journal is how, um, you know, you can see a lot of people posting about it on social media where um, instead of being something static and fixed in a moment in time, like our Dear Data book, this journal is beginning to take up a lot on a life of its own. And so it is, sort of building this new community of people who are new to collecting and drawing data. So that's been quite exciting off the back of it. Um, so yeah, so actually I realized that um, we have, we both have community uh, talks. That's quite nice, isn't it? Huh, okay. <laughs> nice connection, okay. So yeah, so that, that's all that dear data stuff. Um, oh, feel free to pass it for anyone who cares. Yeah, 
Um, so, uh, yeah, since finishing this newer journal, um, with this kind of emphasis on reaching out to more people, I've been working on projects that have been directly informed by some of the think thinking that I've learned when working on the Dear Data project in books. And so I will talk about these now, starting, um, you know, where I've created work for very specific types of communities. And the first that I have done this for is, uh, I guess I'm calling it a hospital community. Um, when I was commissioned by the, uh, the NHS to create artwork for every room in the inpatients wards at the Royal Papworth Hospital, a heart and lung hospital located near Cambridge that's, uh, it moved to a new site of the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. And so it opened um, maybe last spring. Um, and so the artwork that I was commissioned to create was to be placed on glass doors that were across the front of each patient's room. And so it would be seen by the patient and then also down the halls of uh, the hospital. And as I knew, knew I needed to create artwork for 192 rooms across three floors, I knew I needed to automate the process mm -hmm. through working with a developer. And that's when uh, Mike Braunbjerg, who some of you may have heard of, came on board. He's pretty big in the database uh, community. Um, and so besides creating this artwork across 192 rooms, I needed to fulfill the brief given to me where I had to focus on the theme of the living building, consider the human body and be human scaled, and be calming the patients who've just come out of um, quite intensive surgeries. And so um, with so many considerations to take in mind, I had to ask myself, you know, who am I designing for? Am I designing for chart Twitter, data Twitter? Am I designing for the coding community since I'll likely use code? Am I designing for likes or hearts or retweets and so on? Am I designing for like, uh, you know, conference or talk audiences? And of course the answer to all the above is no. And so sometimes I find that these peripheral audiences can get in the way and cause me anxiety when I'm designing a project. And so I had to kind of push those worries aside and strip back and focus on making work that was suited to the daily needs and experiences of the critical patients and the hospital staff first and foremost. So um, taking into consideration, I came up with the following response to the brief. Um, the rooms were across three floors, so I decided to create three different designs, one for each floor that focused on the core parts of the body that the hospital specialized in. This is my like lay person division, so it's not very medical. Heartbeat in the heart, breath in lungs, and the blood in the blood flow that connect the two. And then uh, to incorporate nature in the building, I decided to focus on how there are similar landscapes and patterns found both inside the body and outside in the world, where waveforms are found in heartbeats and waves in the ocean and seas, and branching is found both in the lungs and trees, and flowing patterns are found both in blood flow and blood vessels as well as rivers. And I proposed I wanted to create this work through using data relating to the heart and lung as a starting point where every single inpatient's room would have a completely unique design. And so that's what I proposed, and then I, I won the pitch, and so I had to kind of figure out how to make it happen. So I began to research what data sets were available to match these parts of the body. And so what we uh, decided is that I would use uh, data from the hospital to make that connection between the artwork and the Papworth community. So I ended up working with um, anonymized pulse data directly collected from the Papworth community of staff, inpatients and outpatients to represent the heartbeat um, that you know we collected on like an open day where we were kind of sharing what we were doing. Um, and then also anonymized biometric test data from Papworth medical researchers, and that's a, a test that's used to like test lung capacity and diagnose lung issues. <laughs> and then finally, um, anonymized echocardiogram data, again from the Papworth researchers, which is testing the pumping capacity of the heart and also the intensity of blood flow through the body. So if there's any doctors or researchers here, please forgive this description. Um, yeah, so um, this is what um, some close-up examples of what that looked like um, when it was finished. Um, where this is colored according to the way interior design palette I was given, where I had to keep the design very calm, simple, spare, and linear. Well, this isn't a traditional data visualization. I'm not designing something to tick all the boxes of the online chart critics, but I'm thinking about creating a space using data for someone who's come out of surgery for a pacemaker, bypass surgery, or heart transplant, and so on. 
And so this is uh, what they look like in more detail, where for one floor, that echocardiogram data uh, created a natural flowing pattern across the glass with a number of particles and the variability and turbulence of the flow was dependent on various data points from that echocardiogram. Um, and then uh, on another floor, uh, Mike Bronberg created a processing sketch for me to work with our collected pulse, pulse data where we can loop and train this data in various ways to create these subtle waveform patterns. And um, then find on the final floor, using spirometric data to inform variation in a series of branching plants that alluded to the branching found in the lungs. And this is just how it uh, varied across each room. Um, I have never seen it since it was, in, it was like installed when I was on maternity leave. That's the problem, <laughs> you know, that things don't stop. Um, uh, so yeah, so these are examples of it sent to me uh, during install, so I haven't seen it, but it was really exciting to bring this uh, design using data as its main material and data visits, this design pro um, process into the fabric of such a, a valuable space. Um, so yeah, so that's one direction that I've moved in, and now a more recent one from the past year, it was thinking about a museum community, um, a very different audience. Um, the visitors passing through a museum, um, a, uh, uh, when I was the artist in residence at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich uh, last year, uh, where I was commissioned to explore how to use data as a way to listen and respond to visitors with the intention to make the museum experience more participatory, engaging, and memorable. Um, and then uh, my key data collaborator was, again, my friend uh, Miriam Quick, who I often uh, rely on to be my data journalist and, and, and data person. Um, when uh, settling into the residency, I, this, is, this is where my studio was, right off the gallery, and I became uh, fascinated by the collection of the Royal Navy ship's badges that were on the gallery walls outside around my studio door. Um, they're just really, really lovely, um, and they're very witty and playful in their imagery. And these Royal Navy ship's badges function as the visual identity of a ship akin to a traditional coat of arms. Now, um, you know, I would sit in the cafe and I would observe me the museum visitors as they were walking around. And I began to see them as a fleet of ships where each visitor ship brought their unique personality and view of the world into the, as their cargo into the museum. And so it made sense that each visitor ship should be commemorated with their own ship's badge when made from their personal data. And the fleet of visitors that I noticed in the museum was a mix of parents and grandparents looking after young children, pensioners, school groups, tourists, maritime enthusiasts, men, members of the Royal Navy. So it was an audience that might not know much about data or even art for that matter. And so this informed my and our approach to this project. So first, uh, Miriam and I collected data aiming to create an experience that would appeal to visitors of all ages and also be respectful and thankful of their data contribution, um, especially because they wouldn't be seeing the final artwork, you know, it wouldn't be finished, uh, you know, while we're taking the data, taking the data, gathering data from them. Um, so uh, Miriam created surveys appropriate for children and adults that collected a mixture of basic demographic data as well as questions adapted from the Big Five personality test. And then to end the survey, we also asked respondents what single word they would use to describe themselves. So then you know, that would be, we'd aim to convert it into these ship's badges. Um, we collected data in a very, very low-fi way over five days through setting up a stall like in the middle of the museum where we invited uh, people, families, kids of all ages to take our survey and learn what ship they would be based on their personality. So this survey uh, took a few minutes to fill out and when completed, we would use this lo-fi decoding tool on the left to assess their survey responses, determine what ship they would be, and then we give them a giant literal ship's badge that I designed of the ship that's been stick that on their chest and then kind of, you know, all walk around the museum as fleets of ships. Um, next, we would we gave the participants further context through displaying a tally board showing how many of each ship took the survey, each ship type, and color indicated where the survey taker was from. And so this is how it developed over the, the six days, um, where on the um, last day we ended up with 600 survey responses from this. Um, 
Now, uh, Miriam did analyze uh, the data in more detail, um, but it didn't really show anything out of the ordinary uh, compared to more rigorous personality re research, which this was not a piece, a little, you know, this was not. And in the end, uh, really the most evocative part of the survey was the one word visitors used to describe themselves. So we use this as the main mode of organizing our data. Uh, with the data in hand, I now needed to create this artwork that spoke to the audience I collected data from. You know, lots and lots of children, parents, and newcomers to data. So I decided to move away from abstracted data as it didn't feel right for this all ages audience and instead moved towards a more playful approach. So using the bold graphic elements and playful animals found on actual ship's badges as inspiration, I made first sketches and decided that demographic data would form, inform the external frame of the badge and then this internal watery scene would be created from the visitor's personality scores. Um, so the final system for turning this data into ship's badges is as follows. Each word used by visitors to describe themselves is represented as a badge. Um, the crown in each badge represents the gender breakdown of who chose that word. And then the rope represents the proportion of children to adults who chose that word because, um, yeah, the kids had quite funny things, so you, we wanted to make sure people could t tell that. Um, and then for the main section on the, uh, on the, of the badge, each has an animal on it that represents the average agreeableness score for that word, ranging from a lion representing more competitive and defensive personalities, all the way through to the other extreme of being kind, helpful, and trusting, uh, represented by a dog, and then yeah, everything in between. So a lot of these are actually already on ships' badges, or they were you know, very British um, animals, or they're animals that are found on ships, like I think pigs are found. They had pigs on ships. Anyway, that was a new fact I learned. Um, next, the average extroversion score for the word is represented by the object the animal is holding, where shields and palms obscuring the face represent more introversion, so hiding away, and then animals flying their flags and blowing their own horns represented higher extroversion scores. And again, all of these are, are um, symbols that are found on these ship's badges as well. And then, with the animal sitting or standing and represented the average openness score for that word, where the closer to the water, the more open and unconventional they are, ranging from a fortress or castle for more conventional traditional folk to a rowboat and then a pool ring for uh, less conventional. Um, but then there's uh, more where the water surrounding the animal represented the conscientiousness score for that word. So calm, smooth seas for tidy, organized people, and then tidal waves for people who embrace chaos. Um, and then, yeah, there's even more. So the weather around the animal represented the average level of neuroticism for the word, the sunshine representing those who are stable and calm, to stormy weather representing those who are often worried and easily upset. And so you can see, like, I am being very playful here, but with all these design decisions, there is, regardless, regardless of how playful it is, there's this intent to tie the design to the meaning of the data. Um, and so this is what the final badges look like, um, each representing the aggregated responses for each word used to describe themselves, where every one of these 177 created badges for the 177 words um, submitted are unique. Um, and this is the final piece on the wall, and I think this work uh, really offered a space for visitors of all ages to enjoy the artwork in different ways. As a young child, and there's so many little kids running around to enjoy the animals and all the different scenes that are depicted on them. Um, or as an older audience enjoying reading the words selected by the visitors and using the legend to decode the data. For the data or personality test enthusiasts, of which there were a few that did come up and talk to us, were looking at this higher level. Um, so it did function on multiple levels for multiple audiences, which I think is great. So just to sum up some of my findings over these past few projects and then this general change in how I'm looking at my practice, um, I, uh, you know, as a designer, I'm finding success in using data collection as an interface for engaging and responding to a wider community that might not know very much about traditional data or data. Um, I think by collecting data from a community um, respectfully and then using it to create work, you're putting them at the heart of your work immortalizing their uh, unique patterns and perceptions into something tangible. And I, yeah, I think this respectful data collection uh, reminds a community that they're important and valued. 
And I think from seeing how the, your data project was received, warm, emotive, and playful data projects are the way to captivate a wider audience. More than one might attract if the end result was abstract, cold, clinical, or algorithmic. And so, I think often in some cases, moving away from abstract data representations into a new space seems a way to achieve this. And then uh, finally, uh, this recent project has been a reminder that the community you're creating for, the audience you're speaking to, is more important than your peers, than your Twitter um, followers, <coughs> as you um, need to serve the needs of your audience instead of trying to prove yourself in some nebulous peer group. And while this is always true, um, these projects have driven it home for me. So. Um, yeah, uh, this, yeah, this is my constant anxiety. Maybe it's just me. Um, and just to wrap up, um, so yes, yeah, so that's uh, what I'm up to. Um, this is to wrap up with what I'm doing next. Sorry, this is a really dumb Instagram post. Um, I just uh, want to say that um, I've just, um, I collaborate with my friend Miriam a lot, and we've just handed in our manuscript for a book for Penguin, um, where um, we're extending our explorations and making data physical, appealing, and playful to a more general all-ages audience. Um, in our book that will be published at the beginning of September this year through Penguin. Um, and this is really, really exciting because um, we are writing and designing a book unlike any other data-informed book that you've ever seen before. Um, it's a book with no data viz whatsoever, and it doesn't even mention the word data at all, except in our bios, which couldn't be helped. And I hope that piques your interest because it is really wonderful. And yes, this will be published in se September. Um, so watch out, uh, watch this space, yes. Thank you very much. I'll get the first question while you all think about your questions. Um, while I sketch at work, uh, my drawings will never see the light of day, just because I'm so embarrassed of ever drawing anything uh, like you did, or particularly in a situation like year later where it became so public. Uh, how do you find, uh, particularly when you're teaching others, how do you find uh, a good way for them to overcome that um, inhibition and fear and just the fact that maybe some people don't have the skills for drawing or that talent? Um, well, uh... Sorry about my voice, I sound terrible. Um, I mean, well, the way that I overcome it in my workshops is I actually have, um, I use a lot of, uh, like if you're learning how to draw, there's a lot of strategies that help you break the ice. And the thing that I have people do is just basically fill a page with marks and sketching and just completely cover it black in five minutes. And so that way you can't be afraid of the blank page anymore. And so once people do that, they feel um, a lot more confident. But I don't know, I mean, I think a lot of my sketches are really, really bad. Um, and nobody sees them except for me. And so I think like, if it's in your notebook, no one will see it except for you. It's all about just getting the concept down, getting the idea down, and then you can bring it um, to a tool, to Tableau or something. You know, it's just taking that five minutes to reflect. And um, instead of, uh, you know, thinking, thinking uh, wide, and um, before you're constrained by whatever tool you choose to use. So it doesn't have to be pretty. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Hi. <coughs> oh, hi, Stephanie. Um, how do you find inspiration for your work? Um, I, um, I find, uh, I actually tend to find inspiration, I, I try not to look within the database community because I'm afraid that it will, um, you always have that fear that you'll like take somebody's idea on and then it'll look like you copied. I don't. Again, is that my only my fear? I don't know. So you know, I, I am. So I try to look outside of the database community and like look at like art, painting, weaving. I mean, gosh, that like Annie Albers exhibition that was on a year ago was like like a massive database influence. Um, that was on at the Tate just down the road. Um, so yeah, tr yeah, flowers, paintings, and uh, nature. Um, yeah, other artists, uh, graphic designers. I mean, I think basically any form, any shape could be encoded with data. It's like what this idea of like data, data viz, album art, even, you know, that's like a wonderful place to, to find inspiration as well. So just out, I think outside of the field that I'm working in, I'll, I'll try to see if I can find things to bring into that, that field. Yeah. Hi. 
Um, where do you, or how do you bridge that gap between drawing a visualisation that makes sense to you and then <coughs> that makes sense to people out there? Because I find how I explain things might not be how people understand it. Um, how do I bridge that gap? Um, do I bridge it? Do I bridge that gap? That's it. Um, I don't know. I do a lot of weird prods. Um, I um, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a, maybe I'm not sure. It's a good good answer. Um, I guess the ultimate goal is you just. I will respond in a different way depending on the audience and depending on the context. And if I had to make something for an annual report or an academic paper, I would not be making things that look like this. So I think it's just, uh, um, I have a slide in some of my workshops where I'm like, I just think it's like a constant ba balancing process where I spend a lot of time moving between aesthetic and legibility and that like back and forth, back and forth, and then it'll fall at a certain balance and it'll be different for every single project. I mean, that's like the part where you're wrestling and trying to get your head around it. Um, so I don't, I don't think that was the right answer to the question. <laughs> but maybe it's just like listening, you know what, and I think it's hard for all of us, I think it is hard for me, I guess it's just listening to the people and maybe just talking to people and seeing if they understand it, which I think I definitely don't do enough of. It's scary. I know it does. Yeah. Any questions on this side? Okay, I think that's it. Stephanie, once again, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. And with that, we close the first London Music Group of the Year. Uh, once again, thank you to both our speakers, Neil and Stephanie, and we look forward to seeing you in about six weeks' time. We're just finalizing uh, the next start for February. And with that, have a safe journey home, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.